This morning's scripture reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, and chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. The only survivor of a shipwreck floated on a piece of wood to the beach of a deserted island. He eagerly prayed to God, asking to be rescued. And every day he looked into the distance and see if any help was coming. But nobody came. Tired, he finally decided to build a wooden hut to protect himself from the elements and to store his few belongings. One day, after searching for food throughout the island, he returned home and he found his hut consumed by fire and the smoke ascending into the sky. The worst had happened. I have lost everything, he said. He was shocked with sadness and anger. And he said, God, how could you do this to me? He wept until he fell asleep on the sand. Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever found yourself in the midst of suffering and everything seems to go wrong? In the year 64 AD, Nero was Caesar. In that year, a great fire took place in Rome. And Nero decided to blame it on the Christians. And because of that, the Christians were being persecuted. The Roman historian Tacitus says that Nero burned some Christians as torches in his garden. And that he fed others to lions. Around that date, Peter writes his first epistle to Christians in the northern part of Asia Minor. These Christians were suffering a different type of persecution, not from the government, but from the unbelievers. So Peter writes them to encourage them and to assure them that they were standing on the true grace of God. The main subject in Peter's letter is the Christian suffering. And he also talks about salvation, holiness, being chosen by God, and submission. By the way, The instructors who spoke before me had did an excellent job presenting those topics. Today, I am assigned to speak from Peter's concluding remarks to his letter. First of all, Peter encourages to be humble. Verse 5, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In this context, Peter is not talking only to those who are younger, but to the church in general. The word clothed in Greek indicates the idea of a slave getting getting dressed for service. Basically, Peter is saying, gird yourselves with humility as a slave puts on his apron. Why does Peter mention the need of humility in a context of submission? Well, if you see verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5, can you see behind the exhortation, the pride barrier for those who are younger to be subject to the elders? On verse 3, the same chapter, can you see the pride temptation of elders to be bossy at church? On chapter 3, verse 7, 
Can you see the pride barrier of husbands abusing their authority by mistreating their wives? On the same chapter, verse 1, can you see the pride temptations of wives not submitting to husbands who are not believers? Chapter 2, verse 18, can you see the pride barrier of slaves not willing to obey harsh masters? Harsh masters? What it means to be humble. This is an attitude of the mind, a lowliness of mind, a deep sense of one's smallness. It doesn't mean that we ought to that we should not have self-esteem. Humility is the willingness to perform the lowest and the smallest and the smallest service for Jesus' sake. It means to have a humble opinion of oneself and to value others above ourselves. So being said, if you think are, you are the best of the best, that means you're not humble. There will be the temptation to believe that you are the best Christian at church, the best preacher, the best song leader, the best student at SIBI. You know what? When I came to study here at SIBI back in 2007, my first lesson of humility was given by Brother Ed Wharton on Christian Evidences course. When I did my first test, I was so confident in myself that I was going to do very successful. When I got back my test, I only got 30% grade. And for some reason, my test had red ink all over. I felt humiliated. But you know what? That got me to study more and to pray more. So now I am so proud to tell you that I passed his course with C. Let me share with you some quotes of humility. It was, it was pride that changed devils. It was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. That was Augustine of Hippo. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. C.S. Lewis. Pride is about my glory. Humility is about God's glory. Humility means we lose our pride. But we gain God's favor. Let's continue. Verse 5. Section C. For God opposes the proud. But gives grace to the humble. Peter basically quotes Proverbs 3, verse 34. And the idea here is that God is in conflict with the proud, but blesses the humble. Peter here is telling us the key for Christian life. And you know what? We have to admit that we all have some some degree of pride in our lives. And because of that, we struggle with submission. Verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Basically, Peter is saying, if you want to live the Christian life, you have to humble under God's mighty hand. This is how Christians will be able to endure evil from people, as slanderous people, corrupt authorities, harsh masters, unbelieving spouses, bossy elders. Peter uses Old Testament language here. The mighty hand of God. That hand led the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. That hand led the people of Israel 
throughout the desert. If we look at it this way, the world is our desert. And God is leading us into the promised land, and I mean the heavenly one. We ought to let God lead our lives by accepting his will and the implications of it. If we humble ourselves to God, he will exalt us one day. In Greek, verse 6 and 7 is one sentence. So Peter is telling us how we ought to humble ourselves by casting all anxiety on God. Number two. Be free of anxiety. It says, uh, verse 7, Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Casting your anxiety on God is not a separate thing that you do after you humble yourself. It is something you do in order to humble yourself or in the process of humbling yourself. Sometimes we have so much confidence in ourselves that we think we can handle everything in our lives. And sometimes we become independence. And independence of God is pride, but dependence on God is humility. We need God to handle our problems, to carry our burdens, to let to tell us how we ought to live, how we ought to conduct ourselves in our marriages, at church, in our jobs. What causes anxiety? For these Christians, perhaps persecution, trials, suffering. For you and I, it might be, it might be tragedy, illness. Marriage issues, political unrest. You must be humble enough to believe that there is someone bigger than you that can handle your burdens. And that is God. So, don't be anxious. Trust that he will take care of you. What does it mean to be anxious, by the way? Overwhelming thoughts and feelings of fear, nervousness, and insecurity about what might happen. Usually, not always. This is due to a problem that we face or about to face. Have you ever felt anxious? And I mean very anxious. It's like carrying a big burden, isn't it? Especially when you face tragedy. And you know that. You, your life is at risk, or the life of someone you love is at risk. Oh, that's a horrible feeling. Psalm 55, verse 22 says, Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he will sustain you. Peter is telling us basically the same thing. In the Greek word used here for casting, is the same word used in Luke, Chapter 19, verse 35, when they cast the garments on the donkey so, so that Jesus could sit on it. Peter is telling us, throw your fears, insecurity on the Lord by trusting him that he is able, like a loving father who cares for his child, willing to carry his children love. Number three. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. In order to be sober-minded, you must be free of anxiety. Otherwise, you can't be alert. Our Heavenly Father wants us to face a huge lion, the devil. If we are not ready for him, we will be his prey. The devil will use any fear or insecurity or doubt to make us fall into temptation. Up to this point, Peter has stated three times, be sober-minded. 
And you know what? This state can be messed up by drunkenness, sin, or anxiety. At Gethsemane, the Lord told Peter, Peter, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The Lord knew that the devil's hour was very close. And Peter knew too, because the Lord told him that the devil wanted to sift him like wheat. But Peter didn't take it seriously. That night, Peter almost killed a man. Have you thought about it? Did Peter target the ear or the head? No, think about it. That was a life-threatening situation. A lot of people with weapons. And here you, and here you are with the Lord. They want you, Lord. What will you do? Oh, come on. I understand Peter. But you know what? That was a mistake that he did. He almost killed a man. That night, Peter, Peter swore, cursed, and lied. That night, Peter denied his Lord three times. Because he was not sober-minded, he fell into temptation, but repented. And he was restored. When we face situations in life, persecution, threats, sufferings, problems, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. If you are not sober-minded, he will devour your faithfulness to the Lord. He will devour your integrity before God. He will devour your trust in God. He will devour even your faith in God. What is left if he takes all that? Nothing. Verse 9. Resist him firm in your faith. The word resist here gives the idea of a soldier's call to resist the enemy in battle. We must resist the devil with the shield of our faith. We must oppose him on the ground of our faith. And listen, we are only asked to resist him. We are not asked to take his head off. You know why? Because in the first place, in the first place, we can't. We can't do it. But God can. And you know why? Because the battle belongs to the Lord. And that's a true statement. In the Old Testament, whenever God's people stood firm in their faith, God fought for them. In the same way, if we stand firm in our faith, God will fight for us. Victory is granted. We must resist the devil with full faith, knowing that God is fighting for us. Number four, be aware. Verse 9, section B, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And this statement communicates to us that every Christian suffers. Take courage because you are not the only one who suffers. We all are in this battle. This is a universal experience. The whole community of Christians will face the same things. This is normal. Sufferings are part of being a good soldier of Christ. Chapter 10, I'm sorry, verse 10, section 8. And after you suffer a little while, see, that statement communicates to us that sufferings won't last long. Sufferings for Christians are not intended to be forever. Glory is forever. Take courage. Endure it. It's just a little while. Can you? Can you hold on a little bit? Hang in there. Because God has a purpose for you. Verse 10, section B. 
the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. But through this verse, we get the idea that God will develop us through suffering. God will use any suffering to build a character in you. The word translated here as restored can also be translated as perfect. The word confirmed in the original language indicates the idea to fix firmly. The word strengthen communicates the idea to make it stronger. The word translated as establish indicates the idea of laying a foundation. Basically, Peter is saying here, God will make you better after you suffered a little while. God wants us to build in us a character like Jesus. In the Old Testament, God used Babylon and other nations to discipline his people, to remove idolatry, to humble them, to develop a, a sense of dependence on God. In the same way, God used Rome and their citizens to discipline Christians through suffering, not because of their sins, but to remove imperfections of their faith, to develop the character of Jesus in them, to bring them closer to him, to humble you, to develop in you a deeper trust in him, to perfect you, to strengthen you, to confirm you, and to establish you, so that in the day of Christ, you may, you may be found blameless. Peter stated already in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. And there are also some similar language in other letters. For example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. And also 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Verse 11. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word translated as dominion in the original Greek actually communicates power, strength, force, mighty with great power. This is a doxology that Peter used very similar to the one found in chapter 4, verse 11. For a second time, Peter says, the power belongs to the Lord. This is not Peter's wish. He is not wishing that the power be to God. This is a declaration of conviction. This is an apostolic testimony. This is an eyewitness account as one who walked with God and saw his power. Glory, majesty, and power belongs to the Lord. Say amen, please. If you believe that. that whole heart. So what? With full confidence and trust in God, we can humble our lives under his powerful hand. We can cast all anxieties on him, not only because he cares for you, but because he can handle it. He has the power to do it. We can resist the devil with full faith, knowing that God fight for us and that victory is granted. We can endure sufferings because God has the power to make us tougher, to make us stronger. Coming back to my introduction, after the man fell asleep on the sand, he was awakened by the sound of a boat approaching the island. Some people had come to rescue him. And he asked them, How did you know I was here? They looked at one another and said, We saw your smoke signs. When that man saw the smoke, he thought everything was over. But God used the smoke to bring help to him. In the midst of sufferings, we can protest, we can complain, we can be angry with God, 
or we can trust Him. The question is, what are you going to do? God bless.